Mm -hmm. Welcome to McBurdo's expedition into the unknown and terrible. We have been stuck here in the ice for an eternity. Come into the captain's cabin and warm yourself before you head back out on to the decks. Welcome to my cabin. How long have we been trapped in this infernal ice pack? Or in the summer, tropical estuary. Today I shall read to you from my selection of innumerable primary sources because the past said it better. Writers can embellish on a story that they've heard, but hearing the words of someone who actually witnessed an event, sometimes shocking, always amazing. I have not read this before, so we're going to experience it together. I'm going to break in with my opinions. Chances are, as you are a crew member of the HMS Miser, you are not easily upset by the dark and terrible. None of these are very happy. The odd one is, it's a surprise. I will warn you now that these may not have the most politically acceptable ideas or language because they come from the past and things were different then. So make yourself comfy, grab yourself a suitable beverage, and let us block out this howling wind together. Welcome back to my cabin. I hope it has not been too taxing a day. Today, we are going to go back, back, back to the gold rush in California because I happened to live where there was a gold rush. So, uh, the California gold rush. I can't even call it the big gold rush because there were so many. This one is Vigilante Justice, 1851. Mrs. Louise Clapp, who was uh, the wife of a physician, and she lived at Indian Bar. So she wrote a number of letters home to the folks in Max Massachusetts telling them about life in the, uh, in the gold rush, what it was like in California. Because of course she left and didn't see them for years, as you did in the good old days. And they think that we have a hard time now. The facts of this sad case are as follows. Last fall, Two men were arrested by their partners on suspicion of having stolen from them $1,800 in gold dust. The evidence was not sufficient to convict them and they were acquitted. They were tried before a meeting of the miners as, at that time, the law did not even pretend to wave its scepter over this place. What a wonderful way of describing it. Wave its scepter. The prosecutors still believed them guilty and fancied the gold was hidden in a coyote hole near the camp from which it had been taken. They therefore watched the place narrowly while the suspected men remained on the bar. They made no discoveries, however, and soon after the trial, the acquitted persons left the mountains for Marysville. A few weeks ago, one of these men returned and has spent most of the time since his arrival in loafing about the different bar rooms upon the river. I guess he wasn't worried that they were going to be like, yeah, you're still guilty, Ed. Ah, uh, we're going to get you. He's said to have been constantly intoxicated. As soon as the losers of the gold heard of his return, they bethought themselves of the coyote hole and placed about its entrance some brushwood and stones in such a manner that no one could go into it without disturbing the arrangement of them. In the mean, while the thief settled at Rich Bar and pretended that he was in search of some gravel ground for mining purposes. A few mornings ago, he returned to his boarding place, which he had left some hours earlier, with a spade in his hand, and as he laid it down, carelessly observed that he had been out prospecting. The losers of the gold went immediately after breakfast. <laughs> 
don't like it. some vigilantism get in the way of some, you know, nice, you know, two, two, and two. Two eggs, two pieces of bacon, two toast. That's what we eat here on the ship. Except for, of course, the vegetarian sailors. As they had been in the habit of doing, to see if it was all right at the coyote hole. One wonders how big a coyote hole is. I mean, are we talking like a little cave? Are we talking like... Oh, what are we talking about? On this fatal day, they saw that the entrance had been disturbed and going in, they found upon the ground a money belt which had apparently just been cut open. Armed with this evidence of guilt, they confronted the suspected person and sternly accused him of having the gold on his possession. Singularly enough, he did not attempt a denial, but said that if they would not bring him to trial, which of course they promised, yeah, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna take you to trial. Yeah, there'll be a big trial, nice trial, out by the tree. He would give it up immediately. He then informed them that they would find it beneath the blankets of his bunk as those queer shelves on which miners sleep ranged one above another somewhat like the berths of a ship are generally called. Their word, not mine. It's 1851. There, sure enough, were $600 of the missing money and the unfortunate wretch declared that his partner had taken the remainder to the States. Because of course in 1851, <laughs> California's not a state yet. It's a territory. By this time, the exciting news had spread all over the bar. A meeting of miners was immediately convened. An unhappy man taken into custody, a jury chosen, and a judge, lawyer, etc. were appointed. Hey, Billy Bob, you're the judge. Do you know anything about the law? Oh, no, I don't. I don't think that really matters. No, to be fair? Can we be fair here? Uh, there were a lot of highly educated people who went out to uh, mine for gold. It's actually quite amazing. People you would think might be a little above the whole, I'm going to get rich quick and it's totally going to work and everything's going to be great. Getting rich quick is a bit of a problem. It never seems to work that way. I've tried. I went treasure hunting. It wasn't good. Quick money doesn't happen. So ended the lesson. Whether the men who had just regained a portion of their missing property made any objections to the proceedings which followed, I know not. If they had done so, however, it would have made no difference as the people had taken the matter entirely into their own hands. Sir, there's an unruly mob to see. Does it have an appointment? Uh, yes it does. I phoned ahead. At one o'clock, so rapidly was the trial conducted, the judge charged the jury and gently insinuated that they could do no less than bring in with their verdict of guilty a sentence of death. Perhaps you know that when a trial is conducted without the majesty of law, the jury are compelled held to decide not only upon the guilt of the prisoner, but on the mode of his punishment also. Well, why worry about such minor things as, you know, the punishment being appropriate to the crime? It's the good old days. They did things fast. Not approving. <laughs> Just a statement. After a few minutes' absence, the twelve men who had consented to burden their souls with a responsibility so fearful, returned, and the foreman handed the judge a paper from which he read the will of the people as follows. That William Brown, convicted of stealing, etc., should, and in one hour from that time, be hung by the neck until he was dead. Don't steal from minors. I think that would be the moral of this story. By the persuasions of some men, more mildly disposed, they granted him a respite of three hours. Three hours. To prepare for his sudden entrance into eternity. We're going to be really nice. I mean, we're going to kill you, but we're going to give you three hours to think about it. You can write a letter home and maybe, I don't know. Well, there probably wasn't a girl, so no girl, but here's some grog. 
We're nice. He employed the time in writing in his native language. He is a Swede. Could we have just railroaded the foreigner? Maybe? Maybe? To some friends in Stockholm. God help them when that fatal post shall arrive, for no doubt he also, although a criminal, was fondly garnered in many a loving heart. Thieves have mothers too. He exhibited during the trial the utmost recklessness and nonchalance, had drunk many times in the course of the day, and when the rope was balanced about his neck, was evidently much intoxicated. All at once, however, he seemed startled into a consciousness of the awful reality of his position and requested a few moments for prayer. The execution was conducted by the jury. Well, there we go. Maybe that's what America should do. Oh, get the jury to do it. If you think he's guilty enough to die, you kill him yourself. I often think, actually, that in the cases where I do agree with capital punishment, look up Clifford Olson, maybe I'll do a video about him. That would be where I would agree with capital punishment, right there. The, the family should pick, and if they can come to a consensus and say we want this done to them, uh, that's, that's how I feel. When they absolutely have the person dead to rights, again. C. Clifford Olson. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, I, I do agree with the death penalty. In most cases, I. If there is any room for doubt, then no, I don't. But again, C. Clifford Olson. Google it! Google it! But this is interesting. Have the jury do the, do the stringing up. I was performed by throwing the cord, one end of which was attached to the neck of the prisoner, across the limb of the tree standing outside the rich bar graveyard. And when all who felt disposed to engage in so revolting a task lifted the poor wretch from the ground in the most awkward manner possible, the whole affair indeed was a cruel piece of butchery, though that was not intentional, but arose from the ignorance of those who made the preparations. Uh, not reading ahead, uh, but execution by hanging is surprisingly difficult. If the rope is too short, it won't break the person's neck and they strangle. And if the rope is too long, you can pop their head right off. It's surprisingly scientific. It's just not as easy to hang a person as you would think. Oh my god. <laughs> this is really awful. In truth, Life was only crushed out of him by hauling the writhing body up and down several times in succession by the rope which was wound round a large bough of his green leaf gallows. Almost everybody was surprised by the severity of the sentence and many with their hands on the cord did not believe even then that it would be carried into effect, but thought that at the last moment the jury would release the prisoner and substitute a milder punishment. I, I don't even quite understand what what they're doing here. Like half hanging him and then dropping him and half hanging him and dropping him and half hanging Like that's what I think they're doing. That seems rather cruel. It is said that the crowd generally seemed to feel the solemnity of the occasion, but many of the drunkards who formed a large part of the community on these bars laughed and shouted as if it was a spectacle got up for their particular amusement. A disgusting specimen of intoxicated humanity struck with one of those luminous ideas peculiar to his class staggered up to the victim who was praying at the moment and crowding a dirty rag into his almost unconscious hand in a voice broken by a drunken hiccup tearfully implored him to take his handkerchief and if he were innocent the man had not denied his guilt since first accused. To drop it as soon as he was drawn into the air, but if guilty, to not let it fall on any account. That's just grim. That's really awful. Like, oh yeah, uh. Mm-hmm. Don't mind me, just recording. The body of the criminal was allowed to hang for some hours after execution. It had commenced storming in the earlier part of the evening 
and when those who business it was to inter the remains arrived at the spot, they found them enwrapped in a soft white shroud of feathery snowflakes, as if, in pitying nature, had tried to hide the offended face of heaven, cruel deed which her mountain children had committed. Vigilantism, it's not pretty. Uh, it's not nice. And uh, this is the end. <laughs> I don't think we need any more. He's dead. He was tortured. It's not good. This is from Louise Amelia Knapp Smith Clapp. The Shirley Letters from the California Mines in 1851 to 1852. Edited by Thomas C. Russell in 1922. And there you have it.